Thank you. We're going to get a uh, cowboy uh, cafe napkin uh, a perspective on, a, on our budget here today. But one of the things that we like to do on our uh, CAF budget is put things on an animal unit basis. And of course, you all know that animal unit is an old uh, term, but we base an animal unit on the metabolizable requirement of a thousand pound cow, which is 17.3 uh, megacalories per pound. That's our, our one animal unit. And we put it on a per animal unit basis so we can compare prices per animal unit across farms on a common denominator. And so we determine the animal unit values of our herd on July 1. Our budgets are July 1. When you work for a university, you're on a fiscal year, which our fiscal year is July 1. So that's where our fiscal year begins. So this is a table on different animal unit values. And we base on a per thousand pound cow, that's which one animal unit. So you can different, see the different weights there of the different cattle, the different metabolizable energy requirements, and the different animal unit values. So it's very easy to calculate different animal unit values. So we determine how many total animal units we have on the farm, and then that's what we use to determine our, our budgets for our, our different uh, farms that we have. These are the different expenses that we calculate on our farm uh, for all of our different uh, uh, whole farms. Uh, and, you, and you can read those just as well as I can. But we basically utilize the production practices that are directly related to the cattle operation. We do not get into overhead items. We do not get into trucks, taxes, family withdrawal, uh, uh, land payments, those type of things. Because we feel we can't manage those things. Uh, we can just manage things like salt minerals, supplemental feed, vet medicine, etc. So these are the, the uh, production items that we measure uh, on our budgets. Okay, this is the uh, enterprise information from the uh, Baseville Experiment Station. The way that I, I broke this out is I put down the year one, and that basically is our benchmark year. Then year two, three, and four, I just average uh, plus or minus the standard deviations. Because a lot of the expense items really don't change a lot from year to year, so I just combine them. Then the third column is year five, which is the current year that we're on now. A year 12, 13, and that just has five year, uh, five months of information right now. So, um, so our salt and mineral bill, uh, you can see, is around 31 dollars an animal unit. The first year is about 26. Supplemental feed. Let me first describe what supplemental feed is to us. Supplemental feed is what you go to the store to buy. That's what you go to the co-op to buy: corn, range cubes, uh, cottonseed hulls, cottonseed meal. That's what you go to the store to buy. We've not purchased any supplemental feed. And the reason why we haven't done that is because our stockpile butter grass and stockpile fescue, as Dr. Jennings showed you, is high enough quality to maintain our lactating cows during the winter time. So we've not had to buy any supplemental feed. Vet medicine runs right around $20 an animal unit. Growth implants are, is a very cost effective practice. Fly control varies from year to year. It all just depends upon the rain and the flies and just what you really need to do. So that's quite a variation from year to year. Sales commission. Uh, sales commission uh, there is, is not per animals that you sell, it's per animal units grazing on the farm. Sales commission in Arkansas, is, of course, is yardage and sales commission at the barn. This also includes the beef checkoff dollar. And in Arkansas, we also have a dollar that's assessed for the brucellosis program. We, we have a dollar per head that supports brucellosis testing at the barn. We still do that. And there still is a state law in Arkansas that if you bring a heifer calf back to the farm, it has to be calf wood vaccinated. Hauling is an interesting charge. There's a big difference in the hauling charge whether you have five cold cows that you can put all five on the trailer, take one trip to the barn, versus five cows that go five different times to the barn, one head per trailer. So that's why that charge is quite variable. And pregnancy testing is the uh, blood test that Dr. Gadbury talked about. That's, that didn't vary very much. And of course, that was zero for this year because we haven't pregnancy tested them yet. Bull cost, that's the leasing cost. We, uh, we pay uh, $300 per bull for leasing cost. Breeding soundness evaluation, uh, that includes the, uh, the semen test and uh, we had to start uh, tr uh, testing for trichomoniasis because that, that became a uh, Arkansas regulation that any time there's a change of ownership, barring a bull, 
uh, selling a bull or leasing a bull, the bull has to be has a negative trichomonitis test uh, requirement. We buy our cows. Dr. Gadbury mentioned that any time a cow is, asso is, is not associated with a calf, she is culled immediately. And therefore, we buy the cows that are in the same stage of production as a cow was that was culled. And so we buy cows for our replacements. And you can see that's got quite a vari variation on there depending upon the price of cows. And this past year, the price of cows was pretty high. Fertilizer. I've got to keep Dr. Jennings tied down on the fertilizer bill because he likes to spend quite a bit on fertilizer. We do do a projected budget every year for a guide. We lime the first year to put in the, the clover, and we haven't limed since. But um, that's what that, that liming charge is. Purchase hay is exactly that. We do not raise hay on our demonstration farm. When you look at 38 cows and the size of our farm, is you just can't afford to buy the hay equipment. And that's probably true for a lot of farms in Arkansas, but they still have it anyway. So we buy hay. A herbicide, a pain upon a situation, we have herbicide and miscellaneous costs. And so our total cost uh, runs about $519, and it, it varies quite a bit. Our expenses for last year were a lot higher, and I'll talk just a little bit about that, how that's uh, reasonable for them. But that's, that's how we kind of keep our budgets, pretty simple. We calculate the total pounds of beef sold per animal unit. In year one, it was pretty high. And the reason why it was pretty high in year one, because we had a, a low uh, calf crop percent, we sold a lot of cold cows. And that will increase your uh, pounds sold per animal unit. But you can see how it went up in year four, and that was primarily because of selling more calves. Average price per pound received, and you can see how that's gone up over time. That includes everything that you sell, cold cows, uh, calves, everything. That's the way we calculate that. Income per animal unit has increased tremendously over time, and that's probably due because of the market and because we're selling uh, uh, more calves. Income over specified cost per animal unit. That's our, what well, some people refer to that as gross margin. Income over specified cost. First year it was $200. That means that every animal unit was contributing $200 to pay overhead cost. That is not profit. In year four, every animal unit was contributing $443 to pay overhead cost. It went down a little bit from year three to year four, primarily because costs went up in year four. Costs went up in year four because of two main categories. One, fertilizer went up in year four. Uh, and number two, replacement cow cost went up in year four. Those are the two main categories that went up Herd break-even is my favorite calculation. Herd break-even is the cost you must have in order to pay for your production cost. You must sell cattle for that price in order for to pay for your production cost. In year one, it was 63 cents. And I think that's a true cost of efficiency. When that starts to go down, you become more efficient. And it went, um, went up in year two, but it went down in year three, and it went up a little bit in year four. So that's what I like to really pay attention to. Herd break even. On this graph, we've got one, two, three, and four, and the and the white bar is total expenses per animal unit. You can see in year one, two, and three, our expenses were going the correct direction; they were going down. But in year four, our expenses went up, and as I mentioned earlier, they went up because of fertilizer costs went up, and because of uh, replacement cows went up. And as Dr. Jennings mentioned, we fertilize a bit of pastures twice and didn't get any rain on them. And so uh, those things just happen. We try our very best to manage this Batesville station just like a producer would. Because we don't want producers to say, well, you're able to do that practice because you're the university. We can't do that. And so we, we try very much to manage it just like the opera, a producer would. Gross income per animal unit uh, was, was going up the right direction. Uh, that's the um, the, the, the peach color or the red colored bar, I don't know what color you call that. And then the light green bar is the income over specified cost. Once again, some people call that the gross margin, but uh, that was going up the correct direction in, in year uh, two and three, and, and just about was just over $400 an animal unit in year four. So that's where we, we sat. 
So starting in year five, which started in 2012 to 2013, we started with 50 cows. We went up from 38 to 50 cows. So we felt like for four years, we were able to graze for 300 days with 38 cows. And the reason why we started with 38 cows, because that's the average size for the state of Arkansas. And so we thought, well, let's go to 50 cows and see if we could graze for 300 days. And if we can't graze for 300 days, maybe we can still make more net dollars with 50 cows. And so we started July 1 with 50 cows, and, um, and the drought hit us ter terribly hard. And so Dr. Gadbury said we started the breeding season with 40 cows. We, we, culled, uh, we culled 10 cows, and that's the money that we used to buy the hay and to buy the seed and do the planes that we did this fall. And I think that's what a producer probably would have done. We culled 20% of our herd, and so that's where we're sitting right now. And we've not bought back. And we're not going to buy back until our pasture recovery comes first. And that's the lesson we're trying to teach our producers today is that pasture recovery must precede uh, cattle uh, rebuilding. What makes the system work? A good ratio of warm and cool season forages. Optimum soil fertility. Dr. Jennings mentioned we take soil tests every year and we strategically plan our fertilizer program. Electric fences and water placements. Stock, stocking rate not excessive, we're at 2.7. I think that's the key. It's that stocking rate that allows us to keep those calves in the springtime after weaning to put those extra weight on those calves. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that to make a little extra money. Target our fertilization, optimum cow herd and calving season. I think one of the keys, of course, I'm looking at this from the animal side, but I think one of the keys is our short calving season. Uh, we calve in September and October, it's 60 days. And so we're able to really target our animal needs and requirements with the forage quality and quantity. And I think that's one of the biggest keys to our animal, uh, good animal performance. And planning one or more seasons ahead to ensure forage is as good as possible and matches up with our animal nutritional needs. I sure do want to appreciate your time and attention today and um, on behalf of the team and and uh, I'm sure you have some questions, and we can get Dr. Jennings and Dr. Gadbury back up here. If you've got some uh, brassica questions, I'm sure we can get uh, Kenny and uh, Steve up here as well. And, and I really do appreciate your time and attention. Yes, sir. sell the calves either in late June or July, we put a value on them then. So there's a value put on those calves all three times. The question was uh, uh, when we put the value on the calves. Now, the second year when Dr. Gadbury showed that uh, chart, we only had uh, one point a pound average daily gain. Uh, though all those gains are on Bermuda grass only. They, they get no other supplement except salt and mineral. Uh, that second year, um, uh, about uh, J July 1st, it got terribly, terribly hot. And th those calves actually backed up for two weeks. And actually, uh, but we weighed them about J July 15th, and they actually lost weight. And so um, if in hindsight, well, I wish we would have sold them the end of June. But that's what happened that second year. But we, we learned our lesson, and we didn't let that happen again. And I think a lot of the, uh, the lack of animal performance uh, this past year was due to the drought as well. But um, it, it, uh, we, have a, we, we value those calves all three time periods. Yes, sir. The question was uh, when we had the animals on Nebraska, did we notice any issues? Uh, this was the first year we were, we were able to graze the Nebraska's on the Batesville project, and it was such a short period of time, and it was also mixed with small grain. Uh, we had a good stand of wheat along with it, and no. Uh, 
they uh, grazed it, did quite well. Now, what we did learn, and you can talk to Kenny and Steve about it, but if key cattle have never been on brassicas before, you can turn them out on a new pasture of it, and they'll walk a path across it, and they'll ball and won't eat anything. But you have to force them to a small paddock so they actually taste it. And once they eat it, they decide they like it. And we, uh, when we grazed our small field of alfalfa this fall, it was right next to a, our training paddock for the brassicas. They were reaching under the fence to get the brassicas while they were grazing alfalfa. So it is very attractive to them. So. But we know it's such a short period of time we didn't see any problems. I had one over here first. On, on the uh, Batesville Experiment Station, it was about 70% cool season, about 30% warm season. And that's why we, North Arkansas, we usually recommend about uh, uh, two thirds, one third cool to warm. When you get South Arkansas, it may be 50 50, or maybe actually you know, a third to two thirds because the season is so much warmer and longer down there. I'd say the, the most common calving season is probably spring calving, but more and more going to fall Especially on the, in the, northern, in the northern half we see more fall than we do in the south. But the Batesville Experiment Station was a fall calving, but our other producers on the different projects, they have various, probably mostly spring. But, uh, but the research has shown, uh, in fact, we just had a long-term experiment finished up at the Batesville Station that shows on toxic fescue, if that's your main forage base, you're better off with fall calving than spring calving because the endophyte will really hurt your calving percentage on spring calving herd. So, back here first. Any issue with pests on the stockpile Bermuda grass? The, the initial part, a couple of years we've seen army worms on that initial growth period, and this year army worms were severe across the entire state. And so we did, we have treated for that, but not every year. That's something that we just watch for. But other pests really haven't had any problem. Was there a question back? Yeah, as an extension agent, I'm interested in how you work with the cooperating farms out in the field. Did you have a, a farm evaluation where you went out and evaluated the farms and set goals, objectives, and how do you, did you work with the farms to make sure they implemented those and kept records and, and those types of activities? Okay, he was asking how we work with the farms to make sure we keep the track of the activities and things like that. That's where Kenny comes in, and Kenny has done a tremendous job with the on-farm <laughs> demonstrations. He's put together a uh, set of recommendations, more or less like a uh, recipe book, for every demonstration. And there's one for the county agent that works with that producer, and one for the producer. And so they can both keep track. And, and Kenny, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but, uh, but he uh, just does a really good job help keeping the county agent, you know, working with the producers. So. I think. I think one of the main things that's made this the project so successful is because of the, we do have the protocols in place. Uh, so when the agent we selecting the demonstration farms is totally up to the agent. The agents know the producers in their county. They know who that who that they work with. They know who they can who they can expect to uh, keep track of the data on the projects. And once we do that, from there, as the agent selects the cooperator, they you know they call on our assistance and we go out and do an overall assessment of the farm. We look at we look at their forage base, we look at their cattle management that we're doing, and we try to pick the practice that would help them the most. So we look and try to see which factor on their farm, if we implemented one single practice, would give them the most benefit. And, and that's where we start. And once we have selected that practice, uh, we go over the protocol with the county agent and the producer at that time. So everybody is on, on board, everybody's on the same page of this is what we're gonna be doing in the project. Here's the timeline for when the practices need to be implemented and how to implement them. And here is the production information that we need you to keep up with.
question back here. The question was including labor in the budget, and the, answer, the short answer to that question is yes, they should include labor in the budget. There's no doubt about it, but when you talk to producers, they never do, and so we didn't, <laughs> but they should, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. October or late October. So it's, already it's already become a start going dormant. And when the nighttime temperatures start dipping under 60 degrees, mm -hmm. that's when Bermuda grass goes into that mode of heading toward dormancy. And when you start dipping below 50 degrees, it's basically done for the year, regardless of what the height is. How is it when you start uh, that that uh, really varies with the conditions. If we get good rainfall, we may have 3,000 pounds of dry matter per acre standing out there. If it's less, we may have 1,500. But we graze what we get. We strip graze it. And uh, that way we can make it last smaller. If you turn them out on the entire pasture, you'll waste a tremendous amount. It, it makes about just about double the number of grazing days you get if you can strip graze it. But we're uh, uh, grazing it at the end of its growing season, so we're not grazing it during that September period when it's trying to grow. Yeah, Chris. John, when you uh, when you start piling Bermuda grass, does that create a lot of late summer increase in fruit crushing the Bermuda grass, or do you just kind of let it go? We uh, usually have that field. We have the Bermuda grass is 40 acres, and it's split up into 10 acre paddocks. Okay. So we'll usually graze through that during the summer and then coming toward late July, early August, we'll pick out one of those and usually we'll uh, either have fertilized it already in July or we try to fertilize it in early August and graze among the other three and let that one grow and that's the one we go on to sep late September, October and we'll graze that one until it, it's gone and usually we can get till the first of November, early November <coughs> on our Bermuda. But we never put on more than 50 or 60 units of in per acre. Uh, and the same on our stockpile fescue. We don't put a lot on it, but enough, we usually have the growth potential to make about a ton to a ton and a half of forage, and that's enough nitrogen to do that. And so we don't exceed that. And uh, our, even on the stockpile fescue, our hope was always if we don't put on more than 50 units, that should reduce our fescue foot problems, but that is some hot, hot fescue that we've had and we've have had issues several years and so that's one of the reasons we're renovating that field. Have you um, had pastures where you haven't fertilized with nitrogen on the stockpile? Some producers do but if you don't fertilize and it has not been fertilized earlier in the year you get very little growth in the fall. It, it really needs that push to get that fall growth. It may green up but it's not going to produce much if it doesn't have the nitrogen. And our our soil test P and K is very good on that particular pasture, so that's the reason we have not put P and K. Uh, but if uh, you know soil test says you need it, well then that would be addition to your program. So, yes, sir. On your stockpiling with with Bermuda grass and or tall fescue, um, when you're strip grazing that, do you allow livestock to back graze to get water? Uh, how do, the question is, how do we manage uh, the livestock to be able to get back to water from a strip grazing stockpile of forage? Um, usually, with uh, the ideal situation, with all these perfectly rectangular fields like every Arkansas producer has, uh, we'll start on the end of the field close to the water and give them a strip for about two to three days. And we try not to exceed that unless it's a special case, because if you bigger than that, we get more waste. But a two to three day strip at a time. And then we just advance the wire across the field. 
So the loafing area, grazed area, becomes larger, and the non-grazed area becomes smaller as you go across. But they have more and more area to lay down, and they travel back to water. There's no back fence. Now, during the growing season, you have to have back fence because it's forage is really growing. But dormant forage, it's not necessary. Yes, sir. John, with, with four years of data showing that you don't have to graze for 140 days to make more profit, are you seeing any of the other producers in those areas start to, to stop these practices? It's, well, like I showed earlier, we've had uh, 146 demonstrations across the state in 50 counties, and it's catching on. We're getting more and more attention, and, and uh, just kind of give you an idea, you know, we had such a drought this summer in Arkansas, and we scheduled a drought meeting uh, central part of the state where the, it really started the most intensely. Had 344 producers attend it, and they expected 150. We had people lining the walls out the hall everywhere, and every drought meeting we had after that was like that. And they, they just packed the rooms. And we talked about these principles plus, you know, winter annual management. I had some CPAs come in and talk about issues if you had to liquidate, liquidate your herds and other issues like that. But, uh, but it is catching on. It, you know, it's like any other practice. You, know, you spend your career hoping finally something happens. But, uh, you know, pr producers are picking it up. And uh, we get uh, requests for, for magazines for interviews daily. In fact, we did two interviews last week uh, on the program. So, yeah, how, have you incorporated, you have these 146 demonstration farms, <coughs> have you been able to incorporate them into educational programs at the county level? Some of them. Yeah, we, we have uh, producer panels and then uh, the county agent, we have a particular meeting and that producer will talk about it or we talk about that, that particular Demonstration if the producer doesn't want to speak. We've had several field days, and Kenny works with the county agents to put together whatever program that's most appropriate. But quite a few field days and quite a few small meetings. Uh, so, yeah, we're trying to get the word out as much as we can. Joe? The opportunity to use alfalfa. Yeah, I, th I think there is. Uh, uh, we there's parts of Arkansas where we really don't have good soils conducive for it, but we have a lot of areas where we can grow. And uh, the when Roundup Ready alfalfa hit the market the first time, it was the first good glimmer of interest around the state that we saw, and then it went away fairly quick. But now it's back on the market again. We have some demonstrations out. People are really looking at them. You know, trying to plant them. And at the Baseville Experiment Station, where I said we had the small field of alfalfa, it's only four acres. It's not Roundup Ready. But that field has not had one good growing season yet, and it's still solid rows all the way across. And people look at that, that how, how does it survive? And it's the rocky. When it's dry, you can't get a wire flag in the ground. Uh, but, you know, good fertility. It, it's amazing, you know, <laughs> how drought tolerant it is. And it fits, it does fit a niche. And I think it can fill in and we've had good luck with the uh, you know we started quite a few years ago planting the alfalfa and Bermuda grass and I think because of the high nitrogen that's going to start picking up more and more too. So, question over here. Uh, the uh, several of these, the whole farms that are in, that we talked about in the whole so the program. Okay. Well, we uh, I was just getting ready to start the those the producers that in those whole farms they were feeding about that 135 to 140 days a winter uh, before they started the program, and then they now they've started working and hitting that 300 day mark more consistently. And their total farm savings has ranged from about 8,000 on Swinton's right, and uh, one Randolph County, Eddie's farm, he saved about $17,000 one year compared to what he had been doing before. So you know, it varies by farm size, but it can be very, very uh, uh, good savings. 
And we've got some long-term data on the ABIP farms about what it takes to produce you know, beef, too. So uh, we had the Arkansas Beef Improvement Program that ran for 10 years. And a lot of production data on that, of, you know, what the cost had meant. So. Oh, uh, just uh, want to mention that Dr. Paul Beck, he's a uh, forage researcher and, and extension specialist down at the Hope Research Station in southwest Arkansas. This year, he started a new research side of this, and up to now, we, you know, a lot of it's been the demonstrations on, the, on farms, but he's put together a replicated research program with the southern version, rather than having the fescue and Bermuda grass, it's Bermuda grass and winter annuals because they really don't grow much fescue in South Arkansas. And so he's collecting research on that at different stocking levels along with it. So he's just now starting to get some data on that. And uh, just <laughs> on his stockpile Bermuda grass this fall, you know, the, with the drought and all, with the little bit of rain they got, they fertilized for it, they were expecting to get two, 2,500 pounds of dry matter. They had 5,400 pounds of dry matter of Bermuda grass produced per acre out there. They thought they would graze it till Christmas time. They produced enough forage, you know, it would last till spring if they needed it, but they wanted to be able to plant the winter annual. So now they had to make a decision, you know, how do they work around that? But tremendous production potential. But he's got the research side started on that. No? You what? No, no. And what I what I tell producers, what I'm telling people that's in this program, if you get where you don't have to feed 140 days and you're feeding 60, 75, somewhere in that range, you don't have to bail your own anymore. You can buy it from somebody that's in the hay business and keep both of you in business. See, that's that's a story worth telling. So you you can hard, hard buy it from somebody that's actually doing a good job. So yeah. Well, their typical small grain uh, system, people would overseed those in an existing Bermuda grass pasture. They normally wouldn't plant that till October. And in a good year under very structured management, you might get grazing by December. Usually it's February or March. Uh, on a tilled seed bed at the Batesville station, Dr. Beck and uh, Don Hubble, they've traditionally been able to plant first week of September on tilled soil and be able to graze by mid-November. With these brassicas, if we can plant them in the last week of August, and we do have to have some soil disturbance, and Kenny and Steve can tell you all the details along with that, but it does need some tillage, uh, we can have forage ready by mid-November, or mid-October, in a good case. November 1st for sure. It doesn't, doesn't have to be complete, just a disc Bermuda sod. It does not have to be completely tilled. The more tillage, the better, but it doesn't have to be completely tilled. But you can't but plant it just like uh, going into Bermuda grass like you would winter annual. No. Uh, we, you have to have some sort of disturbance. We, we have learned the first two, three years we tried it, we learned every possible way not to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and then the last couple of years we've spent figuring out what, what really you should do. Uh, but, yeah, you can't no-till it into an existing sod, you can't just broadcast it in a sod like we do ryegrass. It does have to have some soil disturbance. But if you can do that, get it planted early, by early means before September 15th and first week of September is better, uh, can make tremendous growth. If we get planted late September and first of October, it's really not worth the time. And I've seen the same thing in my wildlife food plots. So. Any other questions? All right, well, if there's no more questions, appreciate your, your attention. Thank you.